Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. John Duyard, and welcome to the Life Spa Podcast. In breaking from our usual podcast format, this month I'm going to share with you an interview I did with the Transform Your Health Summit produced by the Shift Network. There's great information about Ayurvedic principles and how they apply to longevity, your health, and happiness. So I hope you enjoy this interview. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. It is such an honor and a pleasure to have with us Dr. John Duyard. Dr. Duyard is a globally recognized leader in the fields of natural health, Ayurveda, and sports medicine. He is the creator of Life Spa, the web's leading Ayurvedic health and nutrition resource. Dr. Duyard, it is such a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. It's great, great to be here. Thank you. So first off, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you initially came in contact with Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, what was your journey towards becoming a, a, a utilizer of it and a practitioner? You know, I, I was in uh, chiropractic college in the early 1980s and I heard the word, I was taking a 500 hour acupuncture seminar course and I heard the word Ayurveda and I was like, I don't know, something just clicked and I wanted to know more about it. And there wasn't a lot to be had. I ended up going to India for about a three week vacation to try to study Ayurveda in 1986. Ended up meeting my teachers there, ended up staying there for a year and a half. Uh, closed my practice over a scratchy phone from New Delhi. Back then you couldn't get a phone, you know, a line. It was much different than it is now. And um, I met Deepak Chopra there in India, came back and ran his center for eight years. I was uh, thrown into the arena of teaching medical doctors, which is what he was into at that point. And I was teaching weekend after weekend seminars on Ayurveda on, to medical doctors. And I had to really kind of bring out the science behind it to do that well, you know? And that's really what launched me into kind of teaching the ancient Ayurvedic wisdom along with modern science. And that's what I do today. After all these years, I ended up running at a Panchakarma Ayurvedic Center for 26 years. And after that, I started just putting all my knowledge on articles and videos for free on our website at lifespa.com. And it's all about ancient medical wisdom of Ayurveda with modern science. And that's the cool thing that I think that I bring to the table is like, you know, science is good, coffee's good, coffee's bad, soy is good, soy is bad. They can prove whatever it wants. But when you have time-tested wisdom like Ayurveda, thousands of years old, and you have modern science to back that up, I really feel like that's at very, the very least something we should look at and evaluate and, and at least know about. And then you can make your decision from there. But science alone isn't quite good enough. Absolutely. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about the definition of science, because I understand that it's a relatively recent um, innovation in the field of medicine to utilize things like the scientific method in order to discern what is the most efficacious treatment for something. And that there were really different frameworks in a lot of other cultures, and a lot of other paradigms of medicine. So can you talk a little bit about how that plays out and how you see it playing out in the clinic today? Yeah, it's sort of a flawed system because in the scientific method that we have today, you know, you have to have 10 people with arthritis and you give them one medicine and they all get better, which isn't the way it works. You'd have 10 people with arthritis and they can have 10 different reasons why they have arthritis and you treat them in 10 different ways and you fix the cause of the symptom and the, for the reason why they have arthritis versus giving the one medicine that eradicates the symptoms of, of arthritis for everybody, but leaves the cause untouched so it can un only cause more degenerative problems down the road. So the system itself is flawed, which is why, more important, it's such a great question really, why it's so important to have the time-tested wisdom and the science to back it up um, because, um, because one without the other, you know, if you just had ancient wisdom, people say, oh, it's ancient, they don't believe it. If you just have science alone, they can prove whatever it wants, depending on who's funding the study. So you really need to have both to give us at least a platform. And then Ayurveda, of course, takes it much further in terms of really focusing all the effort on the underlying factors. You know, keep asking that next question. Why do I have the, the blood pressure as a po issue as opposed to how can I lower the blood pressure for you? How can I evaluate and understand what why the body is creating high blood pressure 
and what's the purpose for that for the body and how can I get underneath it and bring the underlying balance back and that just requires asking those next questions what caused what as opposed to saying I can get rid of your heartburn for you no problem with this omeprazole pill versus understanding the mechanics of digestion and bringing the balance back so the problem is resolved and it doesn't rear its ugly head down the road in some other degenerative concern. That makes perfect sense. So it's almost like the um, the na nature of the inquiry is different on two different levels. There's the nature of the inquiry on the individual patient level about why specifically the symptom picture is showing, but then also the nature of the inquiry on the research level of saying that, that there is not one unified answer that's available for every patient inside of it. Um, what sort of challenges come up as you're engaged in research in order to bring this modern science into this ancient um, the ancient practice, ancient science, really? I don't know if there's challenges. I find that, you know, when I first started writing, doing videos and articles, Connecting Nationalism and Modern Science, I really thought I'd have, a, you know, five or 10 articles and I'd be pretty much done, you know. Um, but I've got over a thousand articles and videos up now, all for free. And, and um, I think the interesting thing is that the re there's so much research buried in the journals that nobody even knows about. And a lot of times they were studying state, they, they didn't even know they were studying an Ayurvedic concept when they actually did the research. So what I get to do is go in there and find these, these principles, like the principles of circadian medicine, for example. You know, Ayurveda talked about the rhythms of, of being in sync with natural cycles, you know, thousands of years ago. Ayurveda talked about the microbiome thousands of years ago. Ayurveda talked about them as Krimi and the Rig Veda 600, 6,000 years ago. So, so what, I, what I've learned about Ayurveda is that the more subtle something is, the more powerful it is. And, I, and Western medicine is just beginning to have the tools to evaluate the most subtle and the most subtle influences. And I think that's sort of one of the things that I find most fascinating more than challenging is that there's a lot of research that's being done kind of crossing line between, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, quantum, you know, a quantum look at things versus a linear look at things. And there's a ma massive shift in science between do I believe all this quantum information or do I still stay, you know, in this kind of very linear way of everything has to connect. A new study just came out not too long ago, talked about how the brain function is very linear. And, you know, nerves connect to nerves and they create a function. And now they're saying that, you know, even Western medicine, Western science is saying that it may not be so linear, that the, that, that the brain is functioning through what are called biophotons, which are ultra weak of photon emissions, which are light in our brain. And we're actually communicating on the, at the speed of light with light. So it's sort of changing dramatically. And Ayurveda was like all over the biophotons, the idea that prayer or energy healing or distance healing works from these unseen subtle forms of energy that we use in our body to communicate with internally, but also from being to being, from place to place, from person to person around the world at the speed of light instantaneously, these changes can be made. And there's now science to back that up. So it's an explosion of, 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 of uh, verification and valid, 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 uh, validation of, of, um, of uh, um, the ancient wisdom and how, and how profound and ahead of their time they were, and we're only just beginning to catch up. Like I said, I thought I'd only write 10 articles and they'd be done. I have a lifetime and another lifetime of information to learn about Ayurveda and then connect the dots with the science. It's just a fascinating field. It is so fascinating. And it's particularly fascinating in that for this integration to happen, that there has to be innovation on all quadrants and all levels of our understanding of the physical world for it. Like I think about the example that you gave around the transmission of thought at the speed of light. And for us to really understand that, we needed to hit the research point in which we were identifying light as both a particle and a wave, for example, before we could actually grasp what Ayurvedic physicians were grasping innately at the time period that they were articulating these documents and articulating these treatment protocols for it. It's so fascinating. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly why uh, it's so profound because the photons, which are discovered, they've been discovered for a while now, but really understood more recently that there are photons which are both wave and particle at the same time. 
And in Ayurveda, they said that the cause of disease is something called pragya parad, which is the mistake of the intellect, where your mind makes a choice to think of itself as separate from the field. And if you were to restore perfect health to the body, you'd have to restore the memory of pure consciousness and the field together. And the only way you're going to get the mind to become more aware of itself as the field, because it got so attached to the things we can buy, is to become aware at the level where the field and the physiology meet. And the where the fields and the physiology meet is where the waves and the particles are the same, or they can, they can juxtapose, and that's a photon. So these biophotons function at the junction point between consciousness and matter. And if you can put your attention at the place where consciousness meets matter, you can restore like a lamp at the door shines in both directions. Your awareness at that level shines both into the field of the physiology that's lost its way and into the consciousness where we, where we have all the intelligence and the creative intelligence exists. Having awareness there connects both. And that's exactly what this field is telling us. This whole quantum physics field is telling us that, that, that uh, we are quantum beings and we function at the speed of light. And, um, and we also are linear beings and we're mechanical at the same time. But at the fundamental level of our consciousness, our mood, our emotion, our imbalances, they happen energetically and then they slowly morph the body into dysfunction, which is why it takes a long time for an emotional trauma to manifest itself as a disease when you're 30, 40 years later. It, uh, it, it, it takes a while for those energetic impressions to create a physical imbalance or a physical response, but it's real. And there's now science behind it, which is really neat. Because if I was just talking about energy medicine, anybody can talk about energy medicine and make these connections. And it's great. And it's true. And metaphysics is awesome. But it's not really believed in the Western world. You know, a lot of people do and they don't care about the science. But a lot of people still do care about the science. And that's what I try to bring to the table. Say, hey, look, this is really mainstream stuff. And this is something we should all look at. So when I say energetic medicine, people, they, people, some people might like, oh, yeah, that's, that's not for me. We've got the science to back that up now and people should start listening to the fact that the subtle and the more subtle it is, the more powerful it is. And that was an Ayurvedic mandate from the very beginning, which is so cool, really. It's so and, cool. I should, I, and I should add that this human body is designed as an instrument for perceiving that subtle energy. That's what this body can do better than any instrument created to date is be able to perceive the subtle in ways that, that, that instruments can't. And that's what Ayurveda was designed to do, is to keep the body pure, to bring the body into balance, to refine the subtle perception so you can really function as an instrument to perceive the subtle, which not just your little bugs and the circadian rhythms and why the birds fly south and whales migrate, and we should too, we should be in sync with those rhythms and we can actually feel those if you're in tune. And I have science to prove that but we can perceive these things we can't see. Um, your bugs, your microbes are supposed to change from one season to the next to the next. You're giving you, you know, completely different you know, benefits. We're decongesting you in the spring and boosting immunity in the winter and helping you get rid of heat in the summer. But you can't see these bugs. They're also controlling every thought that you have and everything that you crave. If you're craving Snickers bars, it's your bugs craving the Snickers bar, sending a message to your brain and wanting that. But you can't see those little bugs, but they're, they're driving the chariot. I mean, they're really running the show, which is still really fascinating, really. It really is. And you know, you bring up something particularly interesting when you talk about the body as a vehicle for experiencing consciousness. And as I understand it, in the Ayurvedic um, discipline, the sort of science of creative intelligence underneath it, that one of the key things that we're called to do is to have an interface with that field of consciousness, the unified field of consciousness, and to, as one of my teachers uh, put it, to water the root and enjoy the fruit, to really get in contact with that field as step one of the project of remaking our health into the way that it should be. Um, so is sort of the meta goal of uh, Ayurveda that contact with consciousness, or is that a, a secondary dimension to what it is that we're engaged in when we explore Ayurvedic medicine? You know, when you read the Vedic text, they talk about immortality, right? And mm -hmm. that, threw a, that threw a real wrench in the, the validity of, of Ayurveda. <laughs> you know, like, okay, really? I mean, you're going to live forever? 
Well, what does live forever is our soul. And I think a lot of, and this of course is now, I can't give you science to prove that, but I think a lot of people do believe, every religion believes that, most every religion believes that our soul continues. And there isn't, that is the immortal part of us. What Ayurveda was saying was that this human body is an instrument, like you said, to perceive consciousness. So instead of being a blind passenger on the journey of the soul, you can be a realized passenger on the journey of the soul, that you can have the perception to enjoy the fact that this soul is evolving and that this universe is evolving. I, I, I think it's kind of crazy, you know, the whole idea of the microcosm, as is the microcosm is in the macrocosm. Well, let me give you an example from the science perspective of how that works. The bugs in the soil are feeling everything. They are exposed to everything. They get sprayed with glyphosate. They get picked by a, a, someone who harvests them, has, you know, having a bad day. Their emotion is imparted into those bugs. They carry that emotion. They carry the mutagenic effect of the glyphosate into our, into our gut bugs. They transfer through a process called horizontal uh, transfer of genetic material to our genetic material. So our genetic code is responsive and ahead of the curve to the glyphosate so we don't die from glyphosate so the bugs keep their house and they're happy. So we are uploading information to stay alive and evolving based on these bugs. In the same way, our thoughts are being uploaded into the universe, the fields that existed before the Big Bang, which means before space and time. Quantum physics has identified these fields. We were there before and they're still there now. Ayurveda called them the Akashic fields, which take impressions from us. Crazy idea, but our thoughts are uploaded into this, these fields that predate space and time, the Big Bang, and they're recorded in that field. And those fields, which are the fundamental creative intelligence of the universe itself, are in fact evolving. So the universe is evolving, crazy thought, based on our uploaded thoughts. It's really nuts. Um, but it is evolving. I mean, it's not. I mean, we're, we, as part of the Shift Network, I mean, that's a lot of what we're engaged in is helping people to have the frameworks that they need in order to uplevel that thinking, to uplevel the the download that's occurring into the Akashic field, to help to transform the consciousness collectively, for sure. Right. And it's and we're at the same time downloading that information from that field as well. And that's what I mean by being a realized passenger on the journey of the soul where you have a, an awareness sense that you are, you are in connection with the field of consciousness. You are evolving based on that connection, that somehow an access and awareness of, of, of that higher frequency and vibration of functioning allows us to be aware of higher thinking and more profound thinking and more creative intelligence, which is downloaded from that field, which has created everything, right? Versus being, dragged through every rock in the river and being dragged on the bottom as we as we function with a very low vibration, you know, attached to every emotion, to every requirement from our reward chemistry position that we need to be loved, appreciated, approved of, to feel safe and secure versus to feel free to give like the sun gives. We can be the same and it fills us up when we choose to be loved versus, you know, need the love. And that's the journey of the soul, really. And we can be a part of that in an awareness way. And that's kind of the beauty of it is a realized passion of the soul. And I think that's why the human body is so special is we can watch and be aware of the evolution in process. That is absolutely wonderful. And I'd love to transition into a particular uh, Ayurvedic science that I, I know that you have some really interesting insights about, which is the Rasayana and the practice of Rasayana. Can you talk a little bit about what Rasayana is and the different dimensions of it? Well, you know, Rasayana, uh, yeah. So Rasayana has to do with Rasa. Rasa has to do with lymph and certain fluids in the body. And it has to do with the study of that lymphatic fluid, you could say. In one of the eight branches of Ayurveda, it's the study of longevity. And I love this study because the whole reason why, as we were talking about a minute ago, the whole reason why we live a long life or are designed to live over 100 years old, because you need that much time to refine this instrument 
to get rid of and shed all your old emotional traumas and patterns of behavior that even came with you in the, from the last life. We need more time to do it. And as we get older, we are move into the time of our life where we raise our kids, we've made our money. Now we're looking at, you know, finding God before it's too late kind of a thing, becoming really spiritual. And it's not because, it's because that's what the energy of, of, um, of age and wisdom does for us. It makes us choose wisdom to be, instead of being dumb, we become wise. That's why they call it wisdom. It's a choice. And you can choose to actually then become more, choose to, to investigate the more subtle feels. But if you beat your body up and, you know, and, and trashed it and exhausted it and, and abused it over the years, it becomes a little bit harder. Doesn't mean that it's impossible. You, the body is amazingly resilient and can perceive subtle energy, even if there's some broken parts. Um, so that doesn't, that's not a, that's not a deal breaker, but the ideal, the ideal was that we would reach uh, our, our wisdom years with a body that could actually, that has been trained along the way to perceive subtle energy and also accomplish the goals of life. So you're not attached to needing anything anymore. You're done. I have what I need. Now I want something more real. I raised my family. I made my, it's the four of the four aims of life, right? You have comma, which is pleasure. Pleasure from the point of connecting with people in a heart to heart basis, not just getting things. You know, Artha, which is wealth, not just making money, but making, having a, the wealth in terms of not being attached, learning not to be attached to those, those, the fruits of your actions or the money that you made or the things that you have. And then, of course, you know, Dharma is the, the, the next, you know, goal of life. And that's, you know, duty, which really means living your life in sync with the laws and rhythms of nature starting to become more subtle now, becoming aware of the circadian rhythms, living in sync, eating in season, going with the rhythms, going, getting this boat to go downstream towards the ocean. You're getting closer to the ocean, make sure you're going in the right direction. And that's the, you know, living your life in harmony with the natural rhythms. And then comes moksha, then the freedom. You find that you're now you're in the ocean and now you're in those wisdom years where you're really beginning to go, you know what? I did all that. I have no attachment to all that. And now I'm free to really investigate the subtle energy that, that we're designed to perceive. Beautiful, really. It really is phenomenal and so um, humane in a lot of ways. It really leans into what many of us are experiencing as sort of innate to the human experience rather than trying to push against it and say that we need to be at the exact same level and type of productivity for our entire life cycle or that we need to burn ourselves all the way out. Um, many questions that emerge from that. And a key one is first a personal one. Um, you know, I, like a lot of people, lived a really unhealthy life in my early years. I was a journalist and lived on cigarettes and coffee and whiskey, you know, <laughs> and it is so, for, and I'm not a unique case in that capacity with it. And so if I lived an unhealthy life in my early years, can I still recover and still work to become healthy and vital at 100? Yeah, absolutely. You can. It is, that's the beauty of the human body. As I, as I was mentioning, it's so rejuvenative and the science of rejuvenation is Rasayana. And that's what the whole point is. And there's two aspects of Rasayana that are so critical. One is called Ahara Rasayana, which is um, the food that you eat, right? It makes a difference. And then the other one is called Ushara Rasayana, which is um, um, the herbs that you can use. So foods and herbs, the things that we consume mm. are you know, really, really important. And there's other ones, uh, Vihara Rasayana and Achara Rasayana, which are the lifestyle and the, and, the, uh, and the behavior that we have that are all designed to be sattvic. Sattvic means that um, they're based on the truth versus the non-truth. The truth is that we are beings of love, beings that when we give, and we care, and we're compassionate for other people or plants or whatever, that our body thrives. Our microbiome, you know, the good bugs proliferate, the bad bugs disappear. Epigenetically, when we give without an expectation to get a reward or get approval or appreciation by someone else, it's called eudaimonic giving versus giving in a hedonistic way, right? Or I give you this gift, but don't you like it? And don't I get all this 
I'm getting all this kind of pleasure and this reward from from being the big giver. Like I give a donation. I always say, do you give it anonymously or do you give it with your name? I need the plaque on the wall. Well, the plaque on the wall is your reward. So you're attached to that reward. Well, they measured that a kind of giving, hedonistic giving versus eudaimonic giving when they gave without any expectation or any reward. It actually positively had an impact in the change on the genetic code. When they gave hedonistically, it had a negative effect on the genetic code, which suggests to say that when you are loving someone and giving to someone, but you really want something in return from them secretly, you want them to like you, they can tell that it, you're full of it. They can tell at a subtle level. So they're not going to open their heart to you fully, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to mm -hmm. be like, I'm not sure I really know this person. So I'm going to kind of res res hold back just a little bit. But when someone comes and they give themselves fully to you and they're vulnerable, like the petals of their flower have opened in a delicate way, you're going to feel that they're open. And you're going to feel safe in that in that sunshine to feel safe to open the delicate petals of your flower. Then all of a sudden, now we're communicating heart to heart, truth to truth. And that's the beauty of what we are truly here to do. And Rasayana, the whole science of Rasayana is to get us to do that spontaneously with the things we eat, the herbs we take, you know, the, the behavior we have, and of course, um, the lifestyle that we live, right? In, in yoga, it's called the yamas and the yamas, things to do and the things not to do. And, and they're, but they're all based on delivering sattva. Sattva means I love you, but it's no concern of yours. Mm -hmm. I don't need anything from you in this, in this exchange. Um, it's, a, it's a communion of feeling safe enough to let the more delicate, vulnerable, and most powerful part of us out. That's what really what Ayurveda is about because the whole point of Ayurveda was to evolve this being as opposed to just you know fill it with stuff that you can buy and put in your house and, and get rewards chemistry every day with a movie, with food, with coffee, with stimulants, with beer, alcohol, wine. We just keep filling ourselves with reward chemistry. We think the next thing is going to be my trip to Europe, my next, my next biggest car, my next whatever. Not that those are bad, but they're not it, right? And you can have a nice car, you can have a nice house, you can have all those nice things, but not be attached to them. I think I was, I call it being weatherproofed, and I was weatherproofed many times in my life. I had a building burned down. I was sued for $13 million because my building burned down, other buildings too, and because from Ayurvedic oils and things, it's a whole big story. But, and I, you know, so I had to reinvent myself along the way many times, and I think that really weatherproofed me. And I think it's a great thing to get, to get challenged to see what really matters in your life. And what really mattered was, you know, makes me choke up my family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when everything was gone, I had nothing. All I had left was these six kids we have, my beautiful wife that I love, you know, this, the thing, this love that I love them so much. And, and so, and then happened on Christmas Eve in 1998, my building burned down. And my daughter, who was like seven or something, she saw my building on TV burning to the ground. And she goes, Dad, I think your building's on fire. I said, what? <laughs> on TV? Like, yeah, it was on local news. And uh, I was like, oh, my God. So I drove down there. My fire building was on fire, burned down the whole thing. And, um, and I realized I had this incredible, this thing, because my, my, my kids were saying, is dad going to be like so depressed for Christmas? Like he's going to be so like this all Christmas? Like it was Christmas Eve. And I looked and I said, no, I'm not. And I just like I realized that I had this incredible gift, which was an opportunity to shed the, all the stuff that I thought I needed that defined me, blah, blah. And I was able to do it and ended up two years later, I was in the, in the, in the uh, Himalayan foothills right next to the Nepal, Nepalese border. And I had contacted Dabur and other Ayurveda companies to give herbs to the, me. And I was out dispensing into these tribal regions, which were so far out in the middle of nowhere. You just know electricity, no light. I mean, just days and days of just to get there. And, um, and I was dispensing them and a little boy, I hear call my name. He goes, Dr. John, Dr. John. And I was like, I'm sitting in the middle of nowhere. And he comes up and he goes, I go, yeah, it's me. And he goes, I have a fax for you. And I was like, <laughs> you have a fax for me? And he goes, do you even, how did you even find me? He goes, I don't know. They told me, you to come here, come here, and you'd be here. And I was saying, I mean, I'm like, so like, I'm, like, I'm at least a seven day walk. You know, nobody can get there was on a river, take on a boat. I could drive on a four wheel drive through the riverbed, like three months of the year. That was it, right? So I was like super remote. 
And uh, I opened this fax and it had been wrinkled and opened like a billion times. He was just all like barely legible. And it said that the lawsuit was dropped and it was settled out of court and it was over. And I was like, I looked at that and I was like, you know, I'm so glad I didn't let any of that stress impact me. I was like, take everything if you want. I still have the most important things. You know, things my mom said, get a skill. You'll always be able to, people, you'll be able to help people. You'll always have money in your pocket and be able to take care of yourself and your family. That was true. And, you know, the fact that I didn't let that stress of that weight, you know, depress me. And I realized what was true. The truth was that I had this incredible love for my family. And that's when you give the love, you know, it's what fills you, what fills us up. And that's what we choose. And that's what Versailles is. And fundamentally, that's the bottom line. But you have to look for ways to be the love versus need the love. And you have to take action to do it. You know, in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, Yoga style Kuru Kamani. Yoga style Kuru Kamani means establish being, pull back the bow, become more self aware, establish and become aware of who you truly are, field and physiology together, and then take action based on that. Action to free yourself from the parts of your brain that convince you that you're not conscious this and field any longer, and to restore the memory of pure consciousness in every cell of your body. That's transformational karmic blasting action. That's what we're here to do. So when you actually pull back that bow and take action, you're free. That's what yoga style Kuru Kamani means. That's the main point of the whole Bhagavad Gita is to do that and not be attached to the fruits. And when you begin to do that, that's sattva. I don't need anything to be happy. I'm content with who I am. I'm not saying that I'm 100% there by any means, but I am saying that it's a, it's a journey that I'm on. I call it the game of life and I love playing it. I love playing it because it's like the, 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 the joy of blasting through your fears and your, your, your needs and becoming aware of them, like fruit ripening on the tree in sequence. It just gives you so much joy and motivation to do what we're really here to do versus just get more stuff. Yeah. Oh, that, this is absolutely beautiful. And I'm so thankful that you shared the story about your process of really coming back down to what was important and really what was the the key things that you needed in order to live the sort of life live in your dharma for it um you know that is so much the journey that many folks who are in, engaged in the shift network and in our programming and our courses are on the the lookout for and that they are really attuning to for themselves so thank you for your vulnerability and honesty and sharing your journey into that it's a huge yeah. gift that i don't know what I think you must apply. I, I I don't you I don't share that story because I I mean I, you know in smaller groups with my family friends mm -hmm. and things like that because it's an interesting the details are really funny and interesting but yeah I got to tell you it was a it was a game changer for me you know I realized I call it being weatherproofed you're weatherproof you don't you know you just like you know now take it all if you need to that's fine that's not gonna you know that you can't hurt me that way. That is phenomenal. I think about the image. Um, I don't know if you're a Tarot person, but on the Pamela Coleman Smith, Rider Waite Smith deck, there is the, a card called the Tower, and it has a, a figure of a tower being struck by lightning. And there are several people who are coming out of the tower and returning down to the earth. And one of the meanings of the card is this idea that we do need to have a removal of um, some of the structures that are not working for us to return down to the real baseline root structure that is working and to rebuild from that place. And in your story, I really hear that. And it seems that things like the, the, the Rasayana are a key way from a medical and health perspective that we're able to get back down to those roots of right behavior, right habits, right diet and right supplementation or right nutrition um, more accurately to really build long-term health it, from the lymphatic level through the consciousness level. Um, am I understanding correctly that uh, where the Rasayana fits into the Ayurvedic medical um, schema? It's sort of like, you know, there's many levels of it. You know, Rasayana could be adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha. Mm. Uh, and let's, let's stick with that one. <laughs> let's come back to that one in a moment. Please continue. Ashwagandha, you mean? Yes, because that is like one of those ones that I feel like has really jumped into the mainstream without yeah. necessarily any of the other frame of Ayurvedic medicine or the practices are in, inside of it. And I was particularly curious to hear from your perspective as a practitioner, 
is that of benefit to just add, say, one herb in isolation into your routine, or should it be part of a larger project? It can be. Um, you know, ashwagandha, ashwagandha is an adaptogen. It's a warm, heavy, sweet root harvested in the winter. It's also a nightshade, so it's hard to digest, right? So what they did to kind of solve that problem, it just took the, the withanaloids and other things out of the, of the ashwagandha and extracted it. Now they just give you the actual medical juice, the actual you know, chemicals that they think are providing all the benefits of the ashwagandha. But they typically screw that up because usually they didn't get, because there's so many, like curcumin and turmeric, it's one of 300 you know, constituents in turmeric. So they think it's just the curcumin. It's not just a curcumin by any way, shape, or form. And when you do that and take the, just the extract of the ashwagandha so you can have it year round, because normally the ashwagandha will be a winter root to be eaten because it's heavier and harder to digest in the winter when your digestion is in fact stronger. Science tells us that, Ayurveda told us that, that your digestion is stronger. Why? Obviously, you're eating nuts and seeds and grains and, and all the heavier things in the winter to insulate and stay strong and you need a stronger digestion and you need a bigger fire because you want the fire in you to stay strong as well. In the summer, the food is cooked on the vine from the sun, so you eat it off, but you don't have to heat your body up because it's already hot in the summer. So you don't want, so you can you get the food cooked on the vine so you don't have to put the fire on inside of you. And then, so you have cooling foods in the summer and warming foods in, this, in the winter. We have less digestive strength in the summer and more digestive strength in the winter. So that's why. So ashwagandha, great as a whole herb in the winter. In the summer, from certain people who have weak digestion, which unfortunately like a global problem because people, it's a whole thing is why we have digestive issues. Part of the reason is because we keep taking foods out of our diet and making them easier to digest. And we feed people only baby food, no wheat, no dairy, no nuts, no seeds, no grains, legumes, nightshades, lectins, goitrogens, oxalates, all of it's out because it's hard to digest. And God forbid you eat anything hard to digest. Now you can't because it's too, we might give you a little burping. Well that hard to digest foods is called hormesis and the reason we have a gut immunity 70 percent of your immune response is because you ate hard to digest foods for millions for thousands of years and that causes an irritant in your intestinal tract to cause a, a, an immune response which gives us an immune system and when you take the foods out you have compromised immunity the science is in people who eat wheat for example have four times less mercury in their blood than people who are gluten-free they have more good bugs uh, and less bad bugs. They have more killer T cells than people who are gluten-free. People who start taking food out of the diet, it's a short-term gain, but a long-term loss. And part of the reason why I become so vulnerable to the whole COVID thing is because we didn't challenge our digestion slash detox slash immune system slash lymphatic systems with properly digested seasonal foods that are hard to digest not changing the bugs from one season to the next to the next. So then all of a sudden some bug comes along that normally wouldn't affect you, but now it creates a whole global pandemic because we're, the global food sources have reduced in the last 30 years by 50%. In other words, the diversity of food people ate 30 years ago is now 50% less of the diversity that we had then. They did a bug, a recent study came out just last week and they found that they took poop from, from samples in Utah and New Mexico that were a thousand years old. And they mm -hmm. measured the microbes in that poop versus compared it to modern people. And there was such a lack of diversity in modern people, species that don't even exist anymore. And the scientists at Stanford looked at that and said, less, completely less bugs globally, less diversity, missing species. And they said, this is an extinction event. We're watching the body become less diverse, less capable of fighting off the evils, the viruses that are coming down the pike, and that's creating an extinction event. Tie, you know, infertility, another book out called Countdown, which is all about infertility, but 50% less fertility than there was 50 years ago, or for in 1973 it was compared to, to now. And of course, just the global shortage of food is causing the three extinction events. So we're doing a bang up job, you know, helping the body become extinct. But it's all about us making things easier for us versus the hormetic benefit of allowing the seasonal food, the roughage, the change of the microbes, all that to actually support us and define us. And that is what Rasayana is truly about, is not, you know, not, not eating foods that make you feel bad, but if they do make you feel bad, ask the question as we started this whole conversation about, 
Why does it make me feel bad? Don't just take it out and think you solved the problem. That's why I wrote the book, Eat Wheat. I have no interest in people eating wheat as like the food of the, you know, of the gods or something. <laughs> but I do re re recognize with my patients after almost 40 years of seeing patients, I do recognize that when people can't eat, it's a sign that their digestion is broken down and your digestion and detox systems are the same. So if you can take the, wheat, the food out of your diet, but how do you take the mercury out of the clouds that are raining mercury on every organic vegetable? All the, the 90 million tons of toxic chemicals dumped in, our, in the atmosphere every year that filter onto every organic vegetable. You can't eat wheat, dairy, nuts, seeds, grains, legumes, all that stuff. You can't, you're, and you can't digest that. There is no way you're digesting all those in, environmental, fat soluble, hormonal disrupting toxins that are taking us out in an extinction event. It's crazy, right? So that's why I'm saying, let's do what Ayurveda said hmm, 2,500 years ago, at least treat your digestion first. Don't baby it, right? And that's why I wrote the book, Eat Wheat. And, I, and I've got, e you don't have to buy the book if you don't want because I've got eBooks on digestion, articles on digestion. It's all about, you know, just get the knowledge and get your, get, fix, troubleshoot your digestion, fix the weak link and get back to eating whole foods in season. That's how it works. That is absolutely fabulous advising. And, you know, as our interview draws to a close, which has been such a pleasure, I'll just throw in, by the way, um, I would love to loop all the way back around to the, the start of one's journey with Ayurveda. You've really laid down some extraordinary things about the role between the body and consciousness, about the importance of coming back down to what really matters and how the Ayurvedic project and Ayurvedic medicine can help us do that. And the absolute urgency of getting some of these um, things like good digestion in place as we start to move forward. So for a listener who is maybe just starting their Ayurvedic journey, who is just beginning this the way that you were, what would be your one piece of advice that you'd give them? Circadian rhythms. You know, you have biological clocks in every cell of your body and every sunrise and every sunset, there's a little clock maker in there and they put the clock and they adjust the clock to 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And all the biological clocks know they should go off and go on and, and off and on at the right time. Understanding, you know, when to eat, how to eat, when to sleep, you know, when to wake up, all the biological rhythms. Be, be there for the sunrise, be there for the sunset. You know, tradition, Ayurveda had techniques like Agnihotra, which are ceremonies you would do at sunrise and sunset. Sun salutations, Surya Namaskar, which you do at sunrise and sunset. Allowing yourself to look at the sun in the morning and align your clocks. Like I said, the little clock maker goes in there and pushes that clock exactly to 6 a.m. So you know exactly your body is now aligning the rhythms. And that you know, is now Nobel Prize winning science, so it's no secret that it's important. Uh, but, but how to do it, you know, other than Western medicine says, now we should just take your 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 uh, your um, your statin drugs in the evening or something like that, or you take your aspirin in the evening. Or now that's the new that's what circadian medicine has become is when to take the drug kit at the right time because they sometimes they don't work at all if you take them at the wrong time of day. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you know waking up and moving your body. When should you have breakfast? Should you have lunch? Should you have supper? All the craziness, and we don't have time for all that. But there are answers to that. Ancient wisdom answers back now by modern science, all about circadian medicine. I have a free circadian medicine ebook that might be useful for people to get started. Just read all that and go, okay, this is the basics. This is how to get in rhythm. And then you know, now you're going in the river downstream, you're heading towards the ocean. At least you're headed towards the ocean. That's step one. Oh, fantastic. And um, if people did want to check out this free, free ebook, they can find, find it on your website. Yeah. Yeah, lifespot.com. They can find all that stuff there for free. Fantastic. Dr. Duyard, it has really been a pleasure and an honor today. Thank you so much. Um, do you have one parting thought that you'd love to leave for our audience today? Um, you know, I think we said it. Be the love instead of watching yourself. Be aware of how you need love and then fix it. Mental action. Take action to free yourself from needing that love and do that by taking action to be the love in every area of your life random acts of kindness it's a it's a it's literally a mental thing 
It's literally something you have to become aware of and then see how you're doing the same dumb thing again and again. And then you have to literally take action to change it. Phenomenal. Dr. Duyard, thank you so much for everything today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you to everybody who's tuned into this summit. What a pleasure. Please do stick around for our future sessions. I'm Nick Matos for the Shift Network. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.